My hope is that more Americans will tune in to watch conservative roundtable to find out what's really going on. Thanks. From the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, and it's my great privilege to have as our guest for this broadcast Nellie Gray, the founder and the leader of the March for Life. Uh, Nellie, uh, you're one of the people I most admire in this world because of the extraordinary way in which you have uh, taken your conscience and used it to sear the conscience of a nation by requiring each of us at least one day each year, and hopefully every day each year, but at least one day each year, to remember <clears throat> that every day uh, innocent human beings created in God's image are having their lives snuffed out because of the selfishness, the greed, and the evil of people who should know better and who maybe do know better, but who persist in doing evil. How did you, uh, or where were you, on January 22nd, 1973, when the Supreme Court uh, issued its Roe v. Wade decision? Uh, well, I was at home uh, with my parents, and uh, I simply didn't believe it. I was already very much aware of um, the abortion issue. I was working with the Department of Labor, and um, uh, I became aware of the women's movement. And at the time, I thought that the women's movement simply really wanted equal pay for equal work, and that seemed like a good idea because I was enjoying that. But somehow or another, I didn't really seem... Uh, to be swept up into anything called a women's movement. And then I realized that the agenda was something much broader than equal pay for equal work. And finally, we saw that it included the intentional killing of the innocent preborn children. And at that point, I was incredulous that America would permit the intentional killing of any innocent human being because we had just come out of World War II and the Nuremberg Trials and we had sat in judgment of other countries who killed innocent human beings and passed judgment saying that they had individual responsibility, they knew not to kill in, uh, innocent human beings and they were responsible and would pay a penalty. And then here we are in America going to kill innocent little babies. And uh, I was simply struck by the fact that in my country we cannot be killing any innocent human being because if everybody doesn't have a right to life then nobody has a right to life. Now you certainly were not a professional politician or someone no. <laughs> from the privileged classes. Your dad was an auto mechanic. Uh, you worked hard to get a uh, an undergraduate degree and you did well enough academically so you were able to attend law school, I believe, at Georgetown right. here in Washington, and you became a, a highly esteemed lawyer at the uh, U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, no one thought of you, at least professionally, as a crusader. Nor and, did I. Nor did you. What happened? How did, uh, how did you make the transition? I think it was uh, one of those things that was such a shock to think that anyone would kill an innocent human being from all that we had gone through. We had also just come through the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, we had just put down segregation. We had uh, just gotten laws to assure that all of us would be equal under the law, and now all of a sudden we're going to have killing innocent little babies. And I have to tell you, I didn't really know what abortion was, uh, except that I knew it killed a baby. Uh, I had no idea. Uh, what about fetology? In fact, the, the way that I came to this whole thing, I simply went to a doctor and said, I know a baby is a baby one second after the umbilical cord is cut and one second before the umbilical cord is cut. When does a baby become a baby? And he uh, taught me about the sperm and the egg, at which point it was very clear to me that if we don't have the law to protect everybody at the moment of fertilization, then no one sure. is protected. The first duty of the law, the Bible tells us, is to prevent the shedding of innocent blood. Right. 
And uh, God can't be very happy with this country because we intentionally shed a lot of innocent blood. You've been quoted recently as asking, where, what did they do with the bodies of the 4,000 babies they killed today? Right. It's a, it's a very interesting thing that I said that on a, a radio program not very long ago. And I said, you know, the sad part is that America today suffers the killing of 4,000 innocent preborn children today. Where are the bodies of those children? And I think that that is a very sobering thought that everybody ought to think about. Well, where are the bodies of those children? How did you decide that a march was the way to focus the nation's attention? Actually, it wasn't I who did that. Uh, I, uh, I really must tell the story of the March for Life because it was a group of people, um, particularly pro-life people in the state of New York, who had already been fighting the abortion issue way back in the 1960s uh, in Albany. And um, their pro-life uh, law had been overturned, and they had abortion, and they began working in Albany to overturn the abortion law. And they won, except... Unfortunately, Governor Rockefeller vetoed it, and they didn't have enough votes to uh, override the veto. So they were already uh, attuned to working to save the babies. And this is the late 1960s, after Roe versus Wade. Those same people who were seasoned pro-lifers said that um, we could not, America could not let January 22 go by without memorializing that infamous date in American history. And so a group of the pro-lifers from New York, largely John Mon and Bill Devlin and Jack Short, uh, put together uh, the notion of a march for life. And I uh, was involved by sheer geography. I live in Washington, and they wanted to meet in Washington. They met in my home uh, on one evening and put together the very first march for life for January 22, 1974, at which 20,000 people came. It only took them about three months to put that together. And then, of course, after we had the very first march, we saw that we were going to have to have more marches. And since I was the one in Washington, they used my house, they used my phone, and that's the way you become president of the March for Life. Of course, it developed a life of its own. <laughs> that's right, and, it uh, did. And I want to tell our viewers that they need to put on their calendar now, January 22, 1996. And there'll be a Correct. March for Life on that day. There certainly will. The 23rd Annual March for Life will be in Washington, D.C. We will begin with a program in the ellipse right outside the White House. Uh, we will invite uh, President Clinton to come out and see his uh, pro-life neighbors. Uh, he didn't come out last year, but maybe he'll come out this year. How, how do you support the work of the March for Life? How do you support yourself? Uh, well, I'm a, a retired a federal employee, and I'm a full-time volunteer, and I live no in my home. There are no salaries paid? No. That's an incredible accomplishment. And uh, so your organization survives on the generosity of, uh, of a small number of people, right. and, and your total budget is a very modest one. Right. Well, the, the thing is that um, there is the same energy and the same dedication of the founders of this March for Life. Our board of directors uh, is just about the same people who began this 23 years ago. They're very dedicated, loyal volunteers who do the work, plus uh, the work of all of the Right to Life people throughout the whole United States. Uh, in order to put on this March for Life, it's not only working the administrative work here in Washington. By the way, it's all done with police permits. Uh, and we just have the permits for the upcoming March for Life. Um, it's not only this, but there are bus captains there who bring the people uh, in from their communities. And anyone who wants to participate can do several kinds of things. One is um, organize a bus trip to Washington, D.C. for January 22, 1996. Be sure that you get your local people together and come down. You will find a family outing. Uh, a, um, a camaraderie, a spirit, a love, and a work and dedication to save our country. It's a great day. I've been privileged to take part with my wife and children in a number of them, and it's wonderful to see so many like-minded people who are out uh, with a common purpose. They may be Democrats, Republicans, right. members of the Taxpayers Party, Independents, but what they all have in common is a desire to save those babies. 
And they will see many of these same people up on the podium, too, because we will have representatives of uh, various organizations there. Uh, the program is one of uh, prayer. Uh, you will see your own representatives from uh, Congress, um, senators and, and uh, uh, congressmen there. Uh, a short program of about an hour, and then we actually march. We march for life along Constitution Avenue to the Capitol and the Supreme Court. It's good exercise, and it's, and it's <laughs> a very encouraging event. But I know you do many things in addition to the march. Uh, that's one day, and it takes a lot of work yes. to involve the hundreds of thousands of people who do now come out to march. What are some of the other things on which you're working? Yes, we are around uh, full-time, uh, all-year-long uh, activity. One of the things that we're extremely e excited about right now, uh, just happened to have a copy of the bill, uh, it's um, H.R. 1625, introduced by uh, Congressman Dornan. A great man. The important part of this bill is that this is just what we've all been looking for, we can all agree to it, even uh, uh, the abortionists should agree to this. Basically what it says is that life begins at fertilization. And uh, it came about by a rereading of Roe versus Wade, the January 22, 1973, Supreme Court's infamous abortion decisions. And in rereading that, uh, what I found was that the court had said something which I did remember that they just couldn't figure out when life began. Um, even though they have the whole Library of Congress right next door, this is an introductory biology lesson about a human father and a human mother begin a human uh, child when the father's sperm fertilizes the mother's ovum. And it's very, very simple, nothing complex about it. And uh, life begins, and at that point, then the laws of our land must protect every human being. Nellie, we're going to have to take a break here. When we come back, I want to return immediately to this subject and involve our viewers in the process of restoring respect for life and the defense of life in our country. Please stay with us. We'll be back with Nellie Gray right after this break. Hi, I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus. I'm inviting you to learn more about the Conservative Caucus, a grassroots public policy action organization that was founded in 1974. Whether you're opposed to socialized medicine, interested in making Congress more accountable, stopping the New World Order, fighting gun control, reducing taxes, or restoring America to its biblical premises and constitutional boundaries, we're the organization you're looking for. Please call the number on your screen to get more information about our work. For more information, write the Conservative Caucus, 450 Maple Avenue East, Vienna, Virginia, 22180, or call 703-938-9626. Welcome back. This is Howard Phillips with Nellie Gray, the leader of the March for Life. Nellie, we were talking about H.R. 1625, the Right to Life Act of 1995. Tell us some more. Uh, it's a very interesting one. What it does is immediately restore personhood for the preborn children, which unfortunately the Supreme Court took away. Let, let, let me uh, stop you there for a moment. One of the things that uh, astounded me in reading uh, Roe and Casey was the plain statement, I believe in both cases, by John Paul Stevens, that if the unborn child were a human person, obviously, uh, abortion would be unconstitutional everywhere the authority of the United States were to run. And I was even more shocked to discover that there isn't a single member of the Supreme Court willing to assign legal personhood to the unborn. Uh, it's, well, and that's you... why I'm so glad to see that this has been the centerpiece of your argument and of your advocacy. We, we need to establish the legal personhood of the unborn child. Correct. And uh, that comes right out of Roe versus Wade. When the Supreme Court said uh, several very astonishing things, I think maybe I didn't get it the first time uh, as strong as I did recently as uh, you begin putting the pieces together of Roe versus Wade, because the court said 
uh, after they began uh, talking about various people's views and opinions about personhood. This is not a matter of opinion. This is a fact, and law is built on a factual situation. And the fact is the biology that we've already discussed of each human being comes into existence at fertilization. Now, the court said an extremely interesting uh, one additional piece where it said that in 1973, uh, the Supreme Court was saying that the judiciary at that point in the development of man's knowledge was not in a position, the judiciary was not in a position to speculate when life begins. Now, what that says to me as I reread it was if it's not the position of the judiciary, then it is the position of the fact-finding body and the legislative body, which of course is the Congress. And that's where this bill fills in, that if the judiciary can't figure out when life begins, the Congress can, and this bill does exactly that. Now the court went on to talk about privacy. And you know the word privacy and the right of privacy as such is nowhere in the Constitution. Now, all of us understand that privacy is protected by the Constitution under a number of provisions, including the Ninth and Tenth Amendments and so forth. However, privacy has never included killing an innocent human being. And the court established a privileged class among women and doctors intentionally to kill an innocent human being and call it privacy. However, that right that they attempted to establish, even the court said, was not an absolute right. It was not limit. It, it was uh, indeed limited that the state had an interest in the preborn child and the mother. And so when you put these uh, writings of the Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade to, uh, together, you come up with the fact that Congress can indeed recognize that we have murder occurring throughout the United States. Uh, the Congress must indeed uh, assure that people are not murdered in our uh, country. And uh, so that we get a simple statement by the Congress of saying that the con Congress declares that the right to life which is guaranteed by the Constitution is vested in each human being at fertilization. And that's the operative part of this bill. You know, I'm very glad to see that two presidential candidates, Bob Dornan and Pat Buchanan, have publicly stated this is the fact, they support it, and they want Congress to pass a declaration of personhood. Right. To me, that's the easiest, the simplest, the most straightforward, the most necessary pro-life action that can be taken by anyone in politics. It is. And furthermore, uh, Congress has uh, the legal authority and power to do so, uh, as we find from uh, the 14th Amendment, which says that Congress has the power uh, to um, to define and to uh, formulate legislation to carry out the 14th Amendment, and that's what this does. In addition to which, this hinges not only on the 14th Amendment, but it also includes the Fifth Amendment and any of the other uh, provisions of the Constitution, such as, after all, homicide laws are under state law, so that we used the authority under the necessary and proper provisions of the uh, Constitution. Nellie, I don't know if, uh, if this one has occurred to you, but Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution guarantees to each state a Republican form of government. And historically and jurisprudentially, one of the things which has distinguished a republic from a democracy is the understanding that one's right to life, liberty, and property cannot be uh, distinguished or abridged or compromised without due process of law. And so I would argue that Article 4 guarantees the right to life uh, and that it not be abridged without due process of law. Well, that's true, but uh, as you see, it's specific under Article 5. That's right. The right to life is specific for federal action. It's specific under, uh, in, under the 14th Amendment for state action. The two merge together, but in addition, rather than even just hinging on um, our right to life where you find it in the 5th and 14th or 4th Amendment. You also, though, can find that it is the responsibility of the Congress to do that which is necessary and proper to, to protect the uh, human beings in, uh, with our government. You know, one of the things that undermines 
your efforts, my efforts, the efforts of others who are trying to restore the government as the defender of life rather than the assaulter of life uh, is the fact that some people who profess to be pro-life say that it's okay to kill some babies. And that really confuses the issue. If what you've said is true, and it is, yes. uh, that uh, the uh, human life is created at the moment of fertilization, then it would seem to me to be wrong to kill uh, a child regardless of whose parent the child uh, may, be, may have or what parent and he may have. You know, have. this is one of the interesting things, and I think this is going to be one of the difficult things that everybody has to put their, uh, their head to. You either believe in uh, killing innocent human beings or you don't. This is not an issue uh, of a lot of opinion. Uh, this is a factual matter. Sure. It's a very, very simple situation. You either believe in killing innocent human beings or you do not. It is not the child's fault if the child was conceived in rape. It's not the child's fault if the, uh, if the parent is deficient in some way. It's not the child's fault if the child is deficient in some way. Nor are any of those criteria by which there is justification for intentionally killing an innocent Absolutely. human being. Uh, if one cannot kill uh, an adult by reason of that person's uh, uh, circumstances of birth, one cannot kill a child or That's an unborn true. person for that reason. And you know, back to the Nuremberg trials, uh, America sat in judgment of a foreign power right after World War II and stated specifically that there was no justification for intentionally killing an innocent human being and such actions are indeed crimes against humanity for which a person is individually responsible. And as the various Nazis came forward and says, but the general told me to do it or Hitler told me to do it or somebody else told me to do it, we sat in judgment and said, you are responsible for your own actions. And one of the most important things that has to be understood now is that we would not have abortions if women did not go into abortatoria where a, a so-called doctor is intentionally killing innocent human beings, does not care about the woman, is in fact inflicting trauma on a woman. This is a responsibility of individual women. It is a responsibility of doctors. It is a responsibility of all politicians and all public officials to stop this intentional killing. Absolutely. And you know, in addition to not stopping it, we're subsidizing the missionaries for child killing. Our tax dollars are used to subsidize a worldwide, nationwide organization that is in the killing business, Planned Parenthood. Hundreds of millions of dollars under Republicans and Democrats alike have gone to subsidize uh, something that has been responsible for more deaths than the Nazis were. This is murder incorporated on an on a incredibly large scale. There are tens of millions of uh, dead people on the uh, should be on the consciences of these folks, but they apparently have no conscience. I keep asking again, you know, just as we said, where are the 4,000 children who are killed today? They're out of sight, out of mind. As long as the abortionists can assure that they can have a closed door and behind that closed door they can intentionally kill the innocent children, they can traumatize mothers, they can deny the paternity to fathers, they can force our country to suffer the intentional killing of these children, then what we must have is a professional press which opens up that door and says, what are you doing behind that door? And, and uh, what about the huge fortunes being made by the people who kill for hire? M millions and millions of dollars are being made by some of these people who uh, use the misfortune of uh, women seeking abortion to uh, profit, and they have blood all over their hands. Nellie, we have to take a break now, and when we come back, I'd like you to spell out for us what the Congress, what the White House can do and should do, and what our viewers can do to move the process along. Please stay with us. We'll be back after these messages. Hello, I'm Howard Phillips. The Conservative Caucus has been actively fighting since 1974 for less expensive government and lower taxes imposed upon the American people by the federal government. If you want to become part of our effort to reduce the size and cost and regulatory burden of the federal government, 
I hope you will call the number shown on your screen. For more information about the Conservative Caucus, write us at 450 Maple Avenue East, Vienna, Virginia, 22180, or call 703-938-9626. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Welcome back. Nellie Gray, how can people learn more about the March for Life and your entire organization. Yes, uh, the, one of the big things that we need is for everyone to unify on this project. So one thing is we need sponsors uh, in Congress for H.R. 1625. Uh, we need uh, a coming to the march itself in unity and we urge everyone to write us or contact us. If you can't remember the phone number called information in Washington, D.C., you'll get March for Life. What the, is the phone number? The phone number, 202-LIFE-377, 202-LIFE-377. And what is the mailing address? The mailing address is Post Office Box 90300, <coughs> Washington, D.C., 20090. Bob Dornan is taking the lead on the pro-life personhood legislation in Congress. We are so pleased with his leadership. He has done this before when he helped stop funds for abortion on the in the District of Columbia and some of the other appropriation bills, the military and so forth. He is taking the lead as a sponsor, but he can't do it alone. We need lots more sponsors. So the people watching this broadcast can help by contacting their member of Congress, Correct. senators and reps, at area code 202-224-3121, the Capitol right. switchboard, and ask them to become co-sponsors of H.R. 1625. And if they want a copy of the text and they write you, you'll send it to them. We certainly will. Nellie, thank you so much for being our guest. Thank you and for thank having thank you me. for joining us for this broadcast. We appreciate it very much.